Hey, Sakunja, it's good to see her, and uh, hopefully we can interact a bit during the chat. And Emirata, again, I, I thank you and uh, for the invitation to have the Coin Society be part of this uh, conclave. And my topic uh, today is the present and future of keratoplastesis surgery. Um, I have no financial interests relevant uh, to this uh, presentation, uh, but other than the fact I am a consultant um, for Gore, who is developing a keratoplastesis. So you are, many of you are familiar with the disadvantages of the Boston type one keratoplastesis, and this is true for the RO keratoprosthesis, of course, which has a virtually identical design. Uh, the cost, um, of course, it's more affordable for you in India than us here in the US is 5,000 US dollars per keratoprosthesis. Uh, the unnatural appearance uh, is an issue. Uh, the fact that a donor cornea is required uh, that can undergo necrosis or become infected and the development or progression of glaucoma. So we'll talk about some advances that have been made uh, to the Boston keratoprosthesis and then some newer keratoprosthesis designs that are aimed at uh, addressing these complications. So the first uh, here we'll talk about is this uh, cost in the unnatural appearance as you see depicted here. A newer version of the Boston keratoprosthesis is the Lucia. Uh, you'll note uh, from the image, let me pull up a laser pointer, uh, that this is a very different looking backplate. Uh, here in this case, we have a petaloid uh, appearance of the backplate uh, that is titanium, very different from the backplate that's commercially available. And here's a patient uh, with this uh, Lucia in situ. It does still require a donor cornea. Uh, it is still a two piece design, so similar to the click on version of the Boston keratoprosthesis. Uh, the front plate is PMMA, which the current Boston keratoprosthesis is as well. But you'll notice what's different is Lucia only comes in one power for aphakia. So rather than having uh, a number of aphakic models from 19 millimeters to 31 or 30 millimeters of uh, actual length, in this case, the device is only available in one, which significantly reduces the production cost. And uh, the manufacturer found that 23.5 was the average axial length being requested. So that's what this comes in. Obviously, if the patient has a longer or a shorter eye, a soft contact lens can be worn to correct the resultant refractive error. Uh, it still also comes in a, a pseudophagic uh, power as well. There's also only one diameter of backplate. No longer do we have a seven millimeter backplate and an eight and a half millimeter backplate. Now we have one that's 7.75, again, reducing production costs. The material is titanium, but you note it doesn't have that unnatural metallic silver appearance. In this case, it's sort of a light brown that also can come in a blue model. Uh, and this is achieved through a process called anodization. In the petaloid, uh, design of these openings in the back plate means that the total area for aqueous to gain access to the stroma is larger, so it may reduce the risk of stromal uh, melting, and also gives a more overall natural appearance uh, because of the petaloid appearance being more similar to that of, we, of the iris than the round holes in the current version of the back plate. All right, so another complication uh, that is being uh, looked at is sterile donor corneal stromal necrosis. And why do we see this with the Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis? Well, we see it because we need a donor to carry the keratoprosthesis. So if you have a donor cornea, then you're going to be at risk for developing infection, melting, et cetera, as we see in this picture. Rigid design. The cornea, of course, is flexible as a modulus e elasticity. The keratoprosthesis, the Boston is rigid. And so it just makes sense that over time that that junction between the rigid and the flexible tissue is gonna result in some breakdown of the flexible tissue. And also of course the lack of biointegration. And this is I think really the holy grail of keratoprosthesis development is making a keratoprosthesis that is truly biointegrating. So Gore, uh, the company that makes Gore-Tex, you may be familiar with, uh, there's a lot of ski jackets and uh, make also another other medical materials and devices, has developed a keratoprosthesis that's currently in animal studies. It is fully synthetic. There is no donor cornea required. It's one piece, as you see depicted here, has a flexible optic and skirt, 
The optic is made out of a fluoroelastomer and the skirt is coated with this expanded PTFE, which is the proprietary uh, material that is uh, in Gore-Tex. It is suturable. Uh, so this makes it easier to implant and uh, gives it uh, more uh, integrity as far as after it's been implanted in the cornea and allows for bioadherence, not necessarily biointegration, but bioadherence. What do I mean by that? Well, as you can see this device in cross-section, it's an intrastromal implantation. You see with a skirt here, uh, midsection in the corneal stroma and the uh, wall of the anterior portion of the optic and the entirety of the skirt is coated with this PTFE, which allows for bioadherence to the surrounding corneal stroma. The optic itself, as you saw in the previous image, is flexible. So reducing some of that risk potentially that's associated with a rigid optic. And the surface of the cataprosthesis is flush with the corneal surface. So let's take a look at a video uh, of the implantation. This is in a, uh, a rabbit. In this case, the optic is six millimeters. So a 5.5 millimeter uh, trephination is performed. Uh, then this blade is used to make a mid lamellar pocket. Uh, and then as tree fine is used to open up the uh, remaining posterior stroma. The posterior stroma is then removed and then the device is implanted as you can see here. So in this case, the surgical technique is quite straightforward. Uh, obviously it's easier in a cornea like this that is not scarred or vascularized in a, uh, a real patient. Uh, of course, this, the visualization may not be quite as good. Uh, in some cases, maybe you could use a femtosecond laser to create uh, these incisions, but in many cases it has to be done manually as you see here. And then it's sutured in place. You, you note that the sutures are being passed from the uh, recipient into the, in this case, the donor, which is the keratoprosthesis, a little bit unusual. Uh, but the technique for implantation is, is certainly something that would not be too hard to uh, become facile with. So that device, as I mentioned, is an animal uh, studies. Um, I'm not sure how much I can disclose, but I believe we'll be seeing first in human implantations, hopefully in about a year from now. Uh, another novel keratoprosthesis is the uh, Cornete. This has uh, been designed by a brilliant investigator from Israel. This is also uh, a device that is uh, fully synthetic and does not require a donor cornea. It is a dual member optic and skirt design. The optic again as PMMA, like the Boston keratoprosthesis. The skirt though is electrospun polyurethane fibers, which allows bio-integration. Uh, it's a flexible skirt suturable, and as I mentioned, the big advantage here is the skirt allows biointegration. It's easiest to understand uh, this device by looking at both this animated video as well as a surgical uh, video here on the right. This is Dr. Irit Bahar implanting the first device in Israel a little over a year ago. So in this surgery, the first step is to perform a 360 degree limbal pritomy, as you saw uh, just a moment ago. The epithelium is then removed. The center of the cornea is then carefully marked. This device is then used to indicate location of pairs of sutures that'll be placed, as well as the location for paracentesis incisions that will be used to gain access to the anterior chamber. Uh, an incision is then made along one of these paracentesis incisions. And then we'll note that uh, the device is then prepared. A double arm non-absorbable suture is then uh, passed through, as you see these adjacent marks at the limbus and then through the keratoprosthesis skirt. Uh, once this is performed, then a trephination uh, is performed. The uh, cornea is then removed. If uh, intraocular surgery like cataract extraction, et cetera, needs to be done, this is when it would be per, uh, performed. And then the double armed uh, sutures are then pulled such that the device is brought into uh, its position. Now we need to get the remaining cornea uh, to fit inside this groove on the edge of the optic and that's performed with this device called the snapper. Uh, as you see, and this is, I've, I've done this in the wet lab. This is, can be a little bit challenging, uh, but I think certainly with some practice it can become pretty doable. Uh, then the conjunctiva is closed over the skirt as you see here, and it's closed both the sutures and I think they recommend using fiber and tissue sealant. So it's the skirt that biointegrates into the conjunctiva, a bit of a, a novel uh, design. 
does it truly biointegrate? Uh, well, here we can see this article published in Cornea a few months ago, looking at the uh, device, and I'll zoom in here on the upper right. You can notice here that the arrow, uh, arrows point to fibroblasts that are inside the, uh, the skirt. Now, also in this image here in panel C, the arrows indicate capillaries that have infiltrated the skirt. And here in the panel D, the arrows indicate uh, collagen present in that skirt. So uh, based on uh, this study, we do actually see biointegration of uh, this device. Um, there have been, I think, about five or six cases implanted worldwide thus far. Uh, we're hoping to have FDA approval later this year. And Ed Holland in Cincinnati and I will be the two U.S. investigators for this device. The last uh, topic I want to just briefly touch on is our inability to measure intraocular pressure in patients with a Boston type 1 keratoprosthesis. And this has, uh, I think, been addressed now by the development of this iMate intraocular pressure sensor. Um, you've seen this animated video, uh, eye undergoing character extraction, there's implantation of the intraocular lens. And at the time of cataract surgery, this device can be implanted into the sulcus. You see it's foldable. And in this device will allow real-time intraocular pressure monitoring 24-7. Uh, the company uh, has Implantata Ophthalmics has also de designed a nether version of this called the SC, uh, which is implanted as you see in the suprachoroidal space. So it can be implanted in eyes uh, other than at the time of cataract surgery. And then a patient just uses this handheld telemetry device to measure the intraocular pressure, which of course can be transmitted to a physician anywhere in the world. Now, this is an article from Klaus Christopher's group uh, looking at a group of 12 patients in which they implanted the keratoprosthesis together uh, with this intraocular pressure monitoring device. And the bar graph that you see here shows pretty good correlation between the measured intraocular pressure and the estimated pressure by finger tension. So in conclusion, novel keratoprosthesis designs and materials have been developed to address the limitations of the Boston type one keratoprosthesis. Uh, we expect the early feasible st uh, feasibility studies from Gore and the clinical trial from Cornet to begin late uh, next year or this year, hopefully. And telemetric intraocular pressure monitoring allows for continuous IOP measurement independent of the keratoprosthesis design. And unfortunately though, while a CE mark has been obtained for both the IO and SC, intraocular pressure transducers, um, no clinical trial is planned in the United States at this time. Hopefully this will be available to you in India though in the future. I appreciate your attention. If you'd like to copy this presentation, you can just take a picture of the QR code as this is available on my public Dropbox site. Thank you very much.